Hey guys, it's your best boxing friends. I'm Kelsey. This is Rachel. Ali Bumaye, right? It means Ali kill him. So they're chanting in Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We we'll learned that. That's some geography. So you recently interviewed George Foreman. Yeah. And you had a great little conversation. And yeah, because the, some... I have grew up here in that story. I've seen it depicted in popular culture. I've heard people talk about it. Well, and what is that story? Well, basically, the idea, the premise, which is basically that in Zaire, for the rumble in the jungle, everybody was back in Muhammad Ali. They were chanting that during the fight, you know, and it was like a big thing, right? <clears throat> However, when I asked George Foreman about it, he said that that was make-believe. <laughs> <laughs> that that chant, which is depicted in a really great film called One We Were Kings, it's a documentary about that fight. That that did happen, but Ali was doing it with like a group of fans. And he mm -hmm. said they did it on, on like a bus or something. But that nobody was chanting that in the fight. Even though the New York Times, um, I found a New York Times story from the fight that referenced that chant in the headline. And so it kind of painted this picture that, that like, maybe wasn't reality. That was maybe... All the fans there yeah. were against George Foreman and heavily like were backing Ali. So much so that they, they had this chant that at least was going on during the fight. Yeah, even in was, that. So that, imagine, if you were the Ollie's opponent, it would be kind of oppressive, you know. The like, champion, the undefeated champion, right, George Foreman. Right, to go in like this and it would change, like, um, how you would experience the fight. Yeah, because I was interested, that was the question, I was interested in how did that make you feel? Well, I didn't feel anyway because that didn't happen. <laughs> He said there were an equal amount of people there for both of us. And on top of that, when I did more digging into pre-fight coverage, the pre-fight cover all suggested that as well. Just as many people in Zaire were cheering for George Foreman. Thought George so Foreman, the heavy favorite, was going to win the fight. But because it was a huge upset, because Ali is so beloved, I feel like the narrative changed over time. After the fight, yeah, yeah. and over time. What's interesting is that you uh, went into this interview to ask, and you asked George Foreman that question because you still had the yeah. the perception that that's how, and he's like, oh, that wasn't his experience. And I find that very interesting because how many years has it been since Rumble in the Jungle? Here's a, it's been 45 years this year. <laughs> and that that is still the wide perception. At of, least like, at least a good portion of us, you know, I consider yeah. myself fairly uh, astute. Now I did. I was like, am I just wrong about this? You know, but plenty of people have read it since then and nobody has come to me. And he said, like Foreman said it was a common, like he, the way he answered the question made me think that he had encountered this before. Now he also told me that the idea that, this is another idea, another myth busted by George Foreman about Rumble in the Jungle. He told me that Ali didn't psych him out in that fight. There's an idea that Ali psyched him out and that made him angry and made him whatever. But that didn't happen at all. In fact, the only reason the fight happened at all was because George Foreman made Don King put Muhammad Ali on the phone with him because George Foreman had grown up admiring Muhammad Ali. Talked about loving him when he was Cassius Clay as a middle schooler. And all the middle, all the kids would always uh, say, I'm Cassius Clay, I'm the greatest. And he was one of those kids. And so he wanted to make sure that Ali wanted to fight. Mm -hmm. And then as far as, that's just how he fought. Another interesting thing is I always thought, I, the story I made up from seeing, if you watch old clips of George Foreman in the past, man, he was a scary dude back then. The, the first version of George Foreman that retired for 10 years, scary dude, told me that that was all an act that his mentor, Sonny Liston, taught him. And so when he came back to boxing 10 years later, he was just being himself. Mm. So it's just fascinating insight from one of the best boxing champions ever but also kind of what I, it hit me pretty big as far as all these preconceptions that I've carried around, not preconceptions, but stuff that I've heard or been taught or the myth making of Ali that kind of took over this narrative about the rumble in the jungle. It actually turned out not to be very true. Yeah, well, I think it's important because it, it helps us to know that we should take things with a grain of salt. So, like, we have a big heavyweight fight coming up this weekend between Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury, their rematch. And I would say that the both of them are um, perceived in, like, a certain way or a certain light. And 
we can always take those uh, narratives and perceptions because they're just given to us. Very few of us, you and I, and our best boxing friends here have met either of these people in person. So what we're getting to see of them is a sliver of like who they actually are. And I think that's important to remember across, especially yeah. in this day and age of social media, you don't really know somebody if yeah. all you see of them is their social media presence. Yeah. And so we can take these things with a grain of salt, give people the benefit of the doubt, not or rush just to a, judgment. At least know that when you ever you see a fighter do anything publicly or talk publicly, he's promoting the fight. That's nine times yeah. out of ten. Every time I see headlines about the wild things Tyson Fury says, I think, well, he just says stuff. Or even Deontay Wilder, sometimes he says things that I personally think he shouldn't say. But I know he doesn't really mean it. Like, he's just talking. You know? Right, right. Well, and not even, I think, but it can be, uh, we can take that and extrapolate it across not just promoting a yeah. fight, which us in boxing are more familiar with, but, like, there's a, you know, like, if you took it to politics... Whoa, I always think, we don't talk about the politics on Real Talk. With I always think about this, that whenever um, there's a candidate, uh -oh. I don't really know them. Like, I can't make all these judgments about anybody based on what is given to me oh, in I the media. Reason. I can't. And I, I just think that that's really important to remember because here we are, like, we, we hear from George Foreman, and he gives us a completely different perspective. Yeah. You know? Really fascinating insight. I'll have more from that interview with George Foreman. I found a lot more cool stuff. This is just one of the pieces that I've written. I'll leave a link in the show notes to you, our best boxing friends, uh, and read it. It's awesome. I didn't tell you all of it, so you should read it. Yeah. And uh, keep up with us on social media. And uh, let us know, like, if you're watching the fights this weekend and... You know, we should all be following each other on social media because you're our best boxing friends. So, find us on Twitter. It's true. You gotta tell me because yeah. I'm not just following anybody. I don't just follow any rando. If you're <laughs> one of my best boxing friends, I'm gonna follow you back. Yeah. Thanks, guys.